Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay the taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put to rest... Uh, you, uh, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies, having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there was seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman dies. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read uh, what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now the Pharisees were gathered together. Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. For from that day did uh, anyone dare to ask him any more questions? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, revealing yourself to us in the person of Christ. Thank you for giving us this word, this story, this interaction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm particularly thankful just as, as a religious man um, to see how Jesus interacts with other religious men um, and see the, the greater truth, the greater hope, the greater reality and the good news that he points them to. Lord, I pray that you would point all of us to the great news of the gospel this morning. May Christ be ever on our minds. Let us focus on the text. Let it be clear to us. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see your truth, ears to hear your truth, and and hearts to behold your truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, this will be our last week in Matthew until the new year. I know. Aw, right? Uh, so we're taking a break. We have Advent, as, as Robert announced earlier. We're, we're doing a three-week Advent series, um, and then we're going to have a few standalone sermons. Uh, Pastor Jim is going to preach for us. I'm going to have um, a friend from Houston named Terrence come up. He'll preach for us. Um, but it's crazy to think that I think it was this week a year ago that we actually started the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so in, what, a year, we've done 22 chapters, which I'm like, guys, we're flying through Matthew. It's only 64 weeks. We're flying through Matthew, and you're like, that's so slow. Uh, and then we have long passages like today, right? And, and we, we, we've seen a lot happen, but like these next six chapters, chapter 23 to 28, things get really intense. They get really, really, really intense. 
Things are really starting to pick up, right? We've already seen Jesus teach on a lot of things from giving and fasting to persecution to evangelism. And and he's only going to get more and more intense. He's going to talk about the end times. That's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, We'll cover that in January. Um, so, So we've seen him teach on a lot of topics. We've also seen him do just amazing miracles. And the way that Matthew orders it so that we can really piece together who is this Jesus um, but, but here, at, at this point, I think everything, especially since chapter 16, when Peter said, you're the Christ, everything's really zeroing in on the heart of the gospel, which is the cross. Everything co- here is coming to, each teaching is getting more and more concentrated. Each step that Jesus takes is one step closer to the cross. And here we see Jesus' opposition is getting more and more hostile, and so Matthew's passion narrative gets more and more intense. And so if, if you just sat down and just read this through, like you would read a story, if you just took these, these 28 chapters of Matthew and just read it, it'd probably take about an hour or two to read it. At this point, you guys are going, okay, we're almost to the climax. We're, we're getting here, right? There's, there's been tension building, the rising action. It's been going up. Here's Jesus, the protagonist. And and the religious elite, the antagonists, and, and here's their big last fight before Jesus goes on trial. That's the passage we have today. So it's, it's a very heightened, very severe, very intense, very, very tense um, story that we have here. This, this really, I mean, it's, it's much more tense than, you know, uh, the most awkward Thanksgiving or Christmas, right, that you can think of with, you know, all of your family, with all their weird political views. Like, this is way more tense than that, all right? This is much more tense than that. So this is actually one of the last interactions we'll see with Jesus and the religious elite before he goes on trial, right? Three days after this, he would eventually be mocked, flogged, beaten, and ultimately hung up on a cross and tortured to death, And these are the men that do that. So this is really their last interaction before this. And what they do is they come with trick questions. They come with three trick questions three days before Jesus goes to die. And so what we'll see, I kind of just broke it down. I don't really have points. I'm like, okay, this is this person's question, then this person's question. So there's three questions, and then Jesus has a question. So there's four questions we're going to look at today, all right? So the first one is the questions of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And we see this in verses 15 down to 22. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of context, I think those of us who have been going through Matthew's gospel, we we know a little bit about the Pharisees. Now, the Herodians, you probably don't know a lot about. So basically, these two groups, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they were opposed in just about everything that you can imagine, right? just about everything you can imagine. The Pharisees, they were loyal to God and loyal to Israel. The Herodians were loyal to Herod, hence the name Herodians. Herod, the the Roman ruler, and they were loyal to Rome. They weren't loyal to God and Israel like the Pharisees were. They were loyal to Herod and Rome. But here we see these two groups of people that are opposed in everything, everything, religion, Politi- everything you can imagine, they're opposed on, they actually come together here united, which is really odd. But they're united in their opposition to Jesus. They're opposed politically, economically, religiously, but they're united then in their opposition to Jesus, which, which should shock us. As we read this, If I always say, put your first century hat on, all right? Imagine we're still sitting on this hillside in the country and Matthew has come to our town and he tells us his gospel. That's, that's what happened before this was ever written. Gospels were oral traditions where the evangelist would go town to town and just start to finish tell the story of Jesus. And so imagine you get to this point and you're like, okay, things are getting really heightened. And then he's like, the Pharisees and the Herodians came together and you're like, they don't, they don't come together much. Well, that should set off a few bells for us, all right? Because, but, but that's something I think that's in common, though, when we think about people and groups that oppose the church, that oppose the work of God, that oppose Jesus and his mission. Scripture says that all who are in sin are enemies to God, and, 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 and them being enemies to God is much stronger than them being enemies with each other. 
Does that make sense? And so they, they, they can put aside political and economic differences because they come together united in this opposition to the truth of God. They come together in this opposition to the truth of God. Now, last week we saw, right, that, that true faith submits to Jesus' authority, but here what we see is two groups of people that are unwilling to submit to Jesus' authority. In fact, they, they come and they, they question him. They put him on the stand. They demand answers from him about his authority, the very authority that they're questioning and undermining and unwilling to submit to. And so they come to him, and verse 15 tells us, at the end of verse 15, it says that they came to catch him up in his words. So why'd they come? They came to stump him. And in this first question that they bring, it's actually a really tough one. Now, I know we've read it. A lot of us are familiar with this, right? Who do you pay taxes to? And we know how Jesus answers. But if you were to think about it, it's actually a very tough question. A very, very, very tough question. I, I, I assume, I mean, these are two brilliant groups of people. The Herodians and the Pharisees were like, in, in their own spheres, they were regarded as like the smartest of the smartest of the smartest people. And so they probably sat together thinking through the question, going, okay, if we can get Jesus in one thing, what should we ask? And then they start to go, well, what if he says this? What if he says this? And they start thinking through all the different angles, all the different responses, going, okay, surely this is the question that will stump him. And so they come to him, and it's a pretty good question. It's a pretty good question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And actually, they, the, the Greek word pay is more like give, which is kind of like a, a cut at it. Like, do we, do we give it to them like, like we would give to God? So is it lawful to give taxes to Caesar or not? Now, that's a really interesting question because if Jesus said no, don't pay taxes, that, that, that would really undermine his, his teaching like in society and, and his credibility, but also it would come off like a lot of religious fanatics that came in the centuries before him that's like inciting this rebellion against the government and this resistance and unwilling to submit to the government. Okay, so you can't say no, well, but if he says yes, then the Pharisees go, well, we got you. Not only are you friends with these tax collectors and sinners, these, these, these Gentile, wicked, vile people, but you love the government. You love the Romans. And so really, it's a good question. If you're trying to trip him up, it's a good question. The Pharisees probably want him to say no, forget the government, only be loyal to God. And the the Herodians were probably like, nope, forget that. Submit, submit, submit to the government. Obey them and them alone. And so they, they, they probably wanted these two different things, but then the two groups come together and they go, I think we can get him. I think we got him. Now, they want a yes or no answer. And obviously we see Jesus give them anything but a yes or no answer. And so he goes a different route right? He notices, verse 18, he notices the malice in their hearts. He notices the, the malicious intention. He knows what they're trying to do, and he calls them out on it. He literally calls them hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites. I mean, his, his response is brilliant, because what he does is not only does he call them hypocrites, but he's not just like, you guys are hypocrites, see you later, but he actually starts to pick apart why they're hypocrites, he starts to expose two main things, their greed and their idolatry. Their greed and their idolatry. So, so remember where we are. If you guys remember back, I think three sermons, when I was at Grace Waco and Drake preached here, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. Then he goes into the temple, sees what's going on there, gets angry, flips tables, right? You guys remember that? So we're still in the temple, okay? We're still in the temple. The, the religious people were doing Roman business, in the sacred temple. So Jesus, in chapter 21, verse 12, overturns those temples, just enraged, saying, this is a sacred place. Keep the secular business out of here, all right? So people, at this point, and then Jesus starts teaching, and that's been the last couple sermons. So at this point, people are probably still picking up all of the coins, probably still just picking up all the coins. And, and Jesus doesn't have any Roman coins, which is a denarius that's about one day's wage. And so Jesus doesn't have any of these coins. And so 
He knows, he knows that the people that are questioning him does. Because, I mean, let's be real. If someone flipped over tables in here and money started going everywhere, I don't think we would all be sitting there this calm, right? We would, like the Pharisees, like the Herodians, go, free money, sweet, run, right? And we'd get it. Or if, if we're a little more reserved, we'd have our kids go get them for us, right? So that's the picture, right? So Jesus is interacting with them. They've probably picked up some coins. And so Jesus says, you hypocrites, why are you questioning me? Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me one of the coins for the tax. And then they're like, okay, yeah, we did grab some. Here's one, right? And so right there, he goes, you guys are greedy. You're greedy. I, I literally just flipped the tables over to show you how enraged I am by this. And rather than listening to my warning and heeding my instruction and getting the business out of here, you guys greedily garble up these coins, these Roman coins. You're greedy. G give me a coin. And, and not only that, but then he doesn't just show their greed, he also shows their idolatry. He says, look at this coin. And, and they all probably knew what it looks like. Like, we all know which president's on the $1 bill, which president's on the $5 bill, which one's on the 10, which one's on the 20. I don't know any past that. I don't really carry a lot of cash, right? But a lot of us are familiar with which presidents and what it says on each coin or on each dollar. Similarly, these, these Romans, the Herodians for sure, and the greedy Pharisees, they would probably know and so Jesus starts to pick apart their idolatry. So on one side of the coin, it had a picture of the, Herod, of, of the ruler. His name was Tiberius. He probably had like a crown of bay leaves around his head, like you know, most, most Roman rulers would. And above and underneath it, it, it probably read, this is what scholars think, it, it probably read something like this. Tiberius Caesar Augustus on the top and on the bottom, son of the divine Augustus. And it would say that in Roman. And then he flipped it over, and it was the emperor's wife, Livia. And there it would either say, it either said something like high priest or God and the high priest. Okay, this is, this is just the Roman currency that they had. And, and so the very coin that, that these Pharisees and Herodians were, were greedy over contained blasphemy all over it absolute blasphemy. And so what, what Jesus does, I mean, he's like, look, it says son of the divine and the high priest. These are titles we as Christians know are for Christ alone. But, but he holds it up and goes, you guys are not only greedy over this, but you're greedy over something that blasphemes God. I mean, commandment number one, number two, like done. He doesn't even need to go any further through the Ten Commandments. He easily exposes to them exactly what's on their coin. And, and I love this picture, right? Jesus uses the small silver coin like a mirror to show themselves. L look at your heart. Look at your heart. So he showed them their hypocrisy. He's, he's basically asking them this, specifically the Pharisees. He's saying, you guys, you're the most pious Jews of all. What are you, the most separate of separatists, doing with pagan money in God's holy temple? How, how is it that you hold in your hand these idolatrous images and these blasphemous phrases? And that's what you want more than anything. And then Jesus goes, so render to Caesar what's Caesar's and God what's God's. And, and they're just like, they're, they're dumbfounded. They're absolutely dumbfounded. And, and I love the response because Jesus doesn't answer yes or no. He kind of is like, both? Right? Because he, he, in his response saying, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and God's what's God's, he's, he's saying, yes, there's the legitimacy of the government. You should submit to it. And, not but, and God is authoritative over everything, including the government. Now, notice I said and, not but. These aren't contrasting ideas. But we submit to the government and God is authoritative over all. So we should submit. We should submit. When, when the government, when we get that awful tax bill around this time of year where we need to pay our year-end property taxes and our jaw hits the floor because of how big it is, when they ask for it, we pay it. We pay gladly. We submit to it. And God is over everything. And so if I can pay a few bucks to the government, which, the, which we should, shouldn't we give everything to the Most High God? The true... Not, not, now, who's on the coin? The true, most high God. 
And so in that one response, I'm just like, Jesus, I mean, it's like he drops the mic, walks away. I mean, they're dumbfounded, absolutely dumbfounded. And they walked, it says, they're, they, they marveled. They're like, well, we had no idea he was gonna do that. No idea. We, we've thought through this question. And so they leave. They leave him away. They, they, they go on. And before Jesus can move on, along comes the next group, the Sadducees. And so we see the Sadducees question, verse 23 to 33. Now the Sadducees, if you remember, they're, they're not like the Pharisees at all. They, they are a Jewish religious group, but they're not like the Pharisees. So the Sadducees, they basically believed, instead of the whole Old Testament, the Tanah, which was the, the Torah, which we know as the Pentateuch, the Nuvium and the Ketuvium, that those are the three parts of the Old Testament, they go, yeah, we only hold to the Torah, to the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the authoritative word of God, nothing else. And in addition to that, some other distinctives, which we saw in the text, was that they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. And so obviously they come to Jesus asking a question about what? The afterlife. Okay. But just like the Pharisees and Herodians before them, they tried to trap Jesus. So th this was not a question designed to obtain an answer. It was a question designed to ridicule Jesus and trip him up. And so what they do is, is they, they, they go deep into Deuteronomy 25 and take this obscure verse, right? Which you guys, I don't know how many of you have even made it through Deuteronomy in your Bible reading plan, but this is a very obscure verse that's a very odd mosaic law about what happens if, if, if a man and a woman are married and they have no kids, one of them dies, like what goes on, right? And so Moses kind of lays out what should happen. And so they ask this really odd, hypothetical, like six people need to die for us to get to this situation kind of question, all right? So that's what they ask. And Jesus corrects them. He corrects them very plainly saying, marriages are not eternal. Marriages aren't eternal, which for some of us who, who love being married and love our spouses, that might sound like bad news, but we can be assured just on this topic, we can be assured that our relationship that we have with our Christian spouses will be even better in the next life. It will be. My relationship with Michelle will be better in heaven than it is now. It will be, even though we're not married in heaven. That's good news. That's truly good news for me. That should be good news for her. She's like, good. It gets a lot better than being married to Michael, right? So, so, so Jesus says that, but then he goes on, right? And so they use this really obscure verse out of Deuteronomy. So what Jesus does is he actually uses one of the most common verses that's known to them. He quotes Exodus 3, verse 6, which is a very recognizable, very understandable verse to the Sadducees. And, and it's strategic because remember, he doesn't go to Isaiah. He doesn't go to Jonah. He doesn't go to the Psalms. They don't believe that that's scripture. He goes, fine, I'll play in your wheelhouse. We'll go to Exodus. You believe that Exodus is the authoritative, divinely inspired word of God. That's where I'll go. So he goes to Exodus 3, verse 6. And, and it's important to remember, too, the time frame of Exodus, right? Because this verse calls God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all lived in Genesis. Exodus happens after that. And those guys had been long dead. And so he says, is God the God of the dead or of the living? Hmm. Interesting. And so, so at, at, at this point, right, by quoting Exodus, which is the heart of the covenant that God made with his people, Jesus is pointing them to this reality that at the heart of the covenant is the promise of a real, living, lasting relationship between God and his people. And so it's inconceivable to think that, that God would make promises or give blessings to his people that would automatically cease as soon as they stopped living, and so beyond that, Jesus points them to greater reality that, that it's, this life isn't all there is. And see, this is the big error for the Sadducees, right? Because they knew these verses. It says the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob over and over and over throughout not only the Old Testament, but even in the Pentateuch, over and over. 
And so a verse and a phrase and a sentence that they've probably read a lot, and their eye, I mean, they've probably memorized it. They haven't stopped and dwelt on it and meditated on it and actually thought about it before. They, they, they never, this, this language of this short but yet very understandable, crucial verse like Exodus 3, 6, they've just skipped over. And, and so they fail to recognize the link between God's covenant faithfulness and the resurrection. Because we, we can't read the promises of Scripture and just think that it's only for this life. We can't. I mean, we can't even read the promises of the Old Testament, of, of the Pentateuch, and think that these are promises only for this life. We can't. And so I, I, hope, I hope we don't miss this, right? Right? Like, if, if you aren't a Christian, you've never repented of your sins, you've never believed in Jesus, the, the good news is that the covenant is open for you. You can repent, you can believe. And for those of us who have repented and believed, we're in God's covenant, his eternal covenant, not a covenant that goes until my time clock is up and then it's like, well, all right, that's it. That's the end of God's relationship with Michael. No, it's eternal. It's living, it's lasting, it's forever. It's forever. Like this, this is the good news that I get to be forever in eternal bliss with Jesus. And, and his love for me doesn't, it's just like it doesn't stop if I disobey. It doesn't stop if I die. It goes on forever. It's, it's truly good news that the eternal one, right? That the king of the grave is the one that has made the promise to me. The eternal one has made this promise to me. Not, not some mortal the eternal God, the creator of heaven and earth, who entered time and space and lived and died and rose and lives forever. He's the one who made this covenant with us. That's genuinely good news. That life and our relationship with God does not only exist in these 70 or 80 or 90 years or however many we're given. And so if, if, if maybe you're questioning the afterlife, maybe you're uncertain about what happens after we die, what happens after we... And this, this is not something you just want to guess on. This is not something you want to be wrong on. It's not. And, and I am so confident in this matter that I'm literally staking my entire eternity on this. That's why Paul says, if we're wrong about this, we, Christians, we are to be more pitied than anyone else in the world. We're staking everything we are, everything we have, everything that I am on this truth, who Jesus is. I stake everything on that. And so if, if you haven't, I, I, I'm urging you to do the same. I, I, I am so confident in this, so confident in this. And, and come to him, not because he promised you great stuff. I mean, sure, he does, right? But he's true. That's why we come to Jesus. Because he's true. So you get nothing else from the sermon. Get that. If you need to talk to me or Jim or Robert, or whoever brought you, please come talk to us afterwards. If, if you're a kid wondering, I, I wondered these things as a kid all the time, ask your parents about it. Say, how, how do we know what happens after we die? How do we know that? Parents, get ready. Tough questions. But I trust you, point them to God's word. I, I, I don't want us to be like the Sadducees who heard these answers and were just stumped. And then we left. I, I want us to be like the crowds who just marveled and followed him. Okay, so Jesus doesn't follow, he doesn't fall for the, the trick of the Sadducees, right? Instead, he gives hope to the crowds listening on. Right? Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, who believes in Jesus, who repents of their sins, believes in him for the eternal hope, they'll have everlasting life with him. Okay, so the, the Pharisees and the Herodians came. Jesus sent them on their way. Then the Sadducees come. They get stumped. And then now comes an expert in the law. And this is the lawyer's question. A lawyer, it's, it's not like what we think as a lawyer. This is the law like the Old Testament law. All right, so he's... Other, other translations put it as the expert in the law. And this is probably the one question you and I are most familiar with if we've read the Bibles. And believe it or not, I think Jesus asks like over 300 questions in the Bible. And as someone told me he answers like two or three directly. This is one of them. This is one of the only questions Jesus answers directly. Teacher, 
what is the greatest law? What is the greatest commandment in the book of the law? Now, you go, okay, these other guys were trying to trip him up. Now, this guy, maybe he's just a huge nerd, studies the law a bunch, and just wants to know, goes, wow, he really gave some good answers. Maybe I'll just ask him to learn. Kind of, but not really, right? This question's very loaded. There were 613 commands in the Old Testament, 613 commands. And in verse 35, Matthew tells us the lawyer asked him a question to test him. So it's not just an innocent question. It's a very loaded question, just like the Pharisees, just like the Herodians, just like the Sadducees. And Jesus responds with one of the most common verses or chunks of scripture from the Old Testament. Josh just read this earlier when we were in worship. This is what, what the, the Jews called the Shema, the Shema. And, and that's, that's the first word of Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. And, and this is a section, of is a section of scripture that Israelites would pray daily. They would pray it daily. And what they would do is actually when they would pray it, a, a lot of Jews would hold up their pinky and they'd pray this every single day. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, th- this custom was, was birthed out of, remember in Exodus when, when God sent Moses back to Pharaoh and gave all those plagues? Well, in the third plague, right? In the third plague, Moses performed this miracle and Pharaoh's magicians weren't able to do the same and, and, they, and they just looked at Pharaoh and they were just like, that, that's, that is the finger of God. That's, we can't do that. That's God's hand. And Pharaoh, obviously, was, his heart was too hardened to remember it, but, but that phrase, the finger of God, then became a reason that they then, they hold their pinky up saying, there is more power in God's smallest finger, his pinky, to answer all of our prayers. And so they would remind themselves of that every single day as they would pray the Shema. It's a hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. I mean, it's, it's and he says, that is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. And then what he does is he then goes to Leviticus 19, which is another very common law that a lot of the Jews of the day knew. It's a very well-known verse, especially to experts in the law. You should love your neighbor as yourself. And so not only was Jesus right, but what he does is he shows the lawyer his flaw. In giving him these answers, he's saying, you know these truths, but you miss the application. You know the truths, but you miss the application. Because if you fully loved the Lord with all your heart, you wouldn't be trying to question me right now. You would be loving me. You'd be worshiping me. You'd be embracing me for who I am. If this lawyer really knew, he he wouldn't be trying to reject Jesus and trap him in his own words. He would be like the crowds and just be astonished at Jesus' teaching. Leave everything to follow him. He wouldn't try to trip him up. I mean, this was the man who was supposed to be an expert in the law, but he was missing the one that the law was about. Standing right in the flesh, right in front of him, he missed the one that the Bible was pointing to. Just like our sermon last week, his head was full, but his heart was empty. He was deceived. He was deceived. And I would be remiss if I didn't use this passage now as as a mirror, just like Jesus did with that coin to those greedy men in the temple. If I didn't use this passage as a mirror for my own heart, like, could this be a warning to me? Could it? And, And Guys, I I don't have any of you in mind. I'm not trying to subtly point fingers at anyone here in the crowd, but I'm just saying, me, I know me as a lover of theology, this would be my error. That I would fill myself up reading, meditating, just mining the depths of God's word, building a systematic theology, memorizing scripture, and, and know all these things about God, but not actually spend time with him and commune with him and love him and abide with him. That would be my error. I know that if if I err in one way, I would be just like this scholar. Just like this scholar. 
I mean, this, this is the point of the book where Jesus is coming to a head with the religious elite. Like, these are the seminarians, okay? These are the guys who have their MDivs up on a wall. These are the guys who have doctorates. These are the people who've devoted their lives to study the word just like I have. That's who Jesus is coming. Jesus doesn't come and rebuke the, the prostitute and the children and the, and the tax collector and all these other people that we would go, those are vile people. Why are you dining with them? Those are the same questions the Pharisees asked Jesus. And so I'm sitting here going, I'm the Pharisees in this story. Like if you just look outside how they live, I live like the Pharisees. I spend every single day, I come to this building and study God's word. I, I pray for you. I, I watch how I live. I, I, I counsel you. I, I care for you. I, I'm devoted to God's word, just like the Pharisees were. And, and Jesus doesn't go out rebuking the children, saying, you know, he says, let them come to me. He doesn't go out rebuking all of the tax collectors. He's saying, hey, come follow me. What we see, his harshest rebukes and, and the hardest warnings that he gives in the Scripture are all directed at the religious people because they were all hypocrites. They were all hypocrites. And, and this, this terrifies me on some level, but it also should lead me to go, okay, God, let, let this passage be a mirror to my heart. What do I need to repent of? What, what do I need to confess and put before you? And don't, don't let me miss this. Don't let me miss. I don't, I don't want people reading my story generations down the road going, how could Michael miss this? He spent all of his time with his nose in the Bible. How could he miss this? How could he miss this? I, I, I don't want to be like one who then comes to Jesus out of this arrogance, out of this pride, trying to question him, demanding answers from him. And then what Jesus does after all of these groups, these religious groups, these elite groups, these smart groups of people come and try to question him, he goes, okay, I have one question for you. And this is Jesus' question. This is the last question we'll look at today. That's what we'll close with. Jesus' question, it's in, it's in verse 41 to the end of the chapter. So, so they've, these people have come, they've questioned his authority, they've questioned his view on the government, his view on the afterlife, his view on the scriptures, they've questioned him, everything, and he goes, okay, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. He goes, this Messiah that you believe is coming, who is he? Who is he? More specifically, whose son is he? And they go, well, we all know David's, Right? A lot of us are familiar of, of the promise that God made with David where he says, you will have a son who will reign forever. So they knew this. And so because they knew their Bible, they go, well, David's son. And Jesus goes, okay, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 110. And that's what he does. And in the first verse, David writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put enemies under your feet. And so Jesus says, so if, if David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be David's son? It's a good question. If David called the Messiah Lord, how could he be David's Lord and also David's son? And the Pharisees, they, they found themselves they're speechless, literally speechless. Not only could they not answer it, they didn't have any more questions. They were out of words, completely out of words. And, and I think in that moment, they realized exactly what Jesus was doing. Because without explicitly stating it, Jesus was telling them, I'm the Messiah. You, you come with your questions, you try to stump me, I give you one question that's built on the crux of the Messiah and you can't give me an answer for that. He's saying, I'm the Messiah. And the Messiah would not only be the son of David, but also the son of God. Because he needs to be fully human and fully divine. And so right there, Jesus starts, I mean, unpack, talk about theology, he starts unpacking right there. Jesus was forcing them to see that David himself spoke to this mysterious reality. And in Matthew, I mean, we've seen this in Matthew's gospel. Chapter one, the genealogy. He starts with Abraham and goes to who? David. 14 generations after David came 
Jesus. Jesus. But also, we've, we've seen not only is he the son of David and fully human, but he's fully God. We've seen this, right? Jesus spoke this at Jesus, at, or God spoke this from heaven at Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration. We even see Peter saying, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, you're right. We, we've seen this over and over and over, like he's the Messiah. And, and no matter what the religious people could bring to him, they couldn't stump him at all. Because when they, they tried three times. And what happens is three days later, they're going to try to put an end to Jesus, but the irony of all of this is that in them trying to put an end to Jesus, they're actually bringing fulfillment to all of God's promises. That's, that's the, what, what blows my mind about all of this, the beauty of the gospel is that even those opposed to God, those who are adamantly against and want to do everything they can to destroy him and bring him down, God uses those very actions to bring salvation to the world. He's saying, you can't stop me. In fact, go ahead, try to stop me, and I'm going to use that to only further my kingdom. It's, 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 it's beautiful. It's, it's amazing. It's truly amazing that God uses these wicked men to bring to fruition every prophecy of Scripture. It's amazing. Like, there's nothing God can't overcome. No, no, no question, no, no plot, no scheme, no sin, nothing. He overcame everything through Christ. And that's why Jesus came. And so the question then that I, Michael's question for you is, do you believe that Jesus is the promised sovereign king? Do you believe who he said he was? Do you believe he was more than a prophet, more than a teacher, more than just some, some man who, who walked around for 30 so years? Do you believe that, that he is fully man, fully God, the son of God, the son of David, the Messiah? Do you believe that? Have, have you actually submitted to him not do you see it, acknowledge it, and resist against it, but do you submit yourself to him, not only with your head, but with your heart, with your heart? Will you respond to this question? Like, will you follow him? I, I, I hope and I pray that you will. Let's pray this morning.